Across the world, people are making their concerns known, either by marching through the rain in Dam Square to demand more action, or by boycotting schools on Fridays. Whether it's students taking actions, organizations suing governments, or corporations investing in new and greener technologies, climate action is reaching a feverish height in our society. Today, we will focus on only one type of climate action that is growing in use, climate litigation and, the use, and using law uh, to fight climate change. To help us explore this topic, we have two guests joining us on our stage. Our first guest is Professor Joida Gupta. She is a full professor of environment and development in the Global South here at the University of Amsterdam and was co-chair on the UNEP's Global Environment Outlook. Our second guest is Mr. Freik Bershk. Mr. Bershk is the spokesperson and campaign coordinator for the economy at Mulu Defensi and is the leader for the upcoming Shell climate case. As always, we will have time for audience questions, so when the allotted time comes around, please raise your hands and the microphone will be passed to you. But for now, give a warm round of applause to our two guests, Professor Joida Gupta and Mr. Freik Bursch. Yes. Hello, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. So, Mr. Bursch, you are a campaign leader at Milieu Defensi for the Economy. Could you explain to our audience what Milieu Defensi is and the kind of work you do there? Sure. Uh, so Milieu Defensi is uh, part of uh, International Federation Friends of the Earth. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the, our English name, Friends of the Earth Netherlands. And uh, in the Netherlands, we work um, on uh, basically all kinds of environmental topics, but we are very much focused on climate change for the last couple of years because of the urgency, of course. Um, so one of the campaigns that we have, so we, we, we organize campaigns to uh, mostly pressure uh, governments, uh, uh, national but also local, um, to do more uh, to be better at, at, uh, at their climate ambitions, but also to make sure that, there, that we have a fair transition so that um, uh, a sustainable life uh, can be, uh, is achievable for everyone and that people that are now working mainly uh, in, in fossil fuel jobs have a chance to get a career in sustainable jobs. Um, so uh, we work on things like uh, uh, clean, uh, we have a clean air campaign, so we've been campaigning for the last couple of years, especially in the, in the bigger cities, um, to, to campaign for uh, all kinds of measurements so that cars are uh, polluting less of the, of, the, of the air. And that's of course also connected to climate change because those cars also, you know, we have to have less cars and more electric cars and more bicycles and stuff like that. Um, yeah. and, and the, the climate case against Shell uh, is, is another thing uh, w that we work on, but we'll get to that uh, We'll later. get to that later, yeah. And Professor Gupta, the, um, on March the 13th, the Global Environmental Outlook 6 was published by the UNEP. How did this one differ from the last report? Well, this report is different from the previous report because it focuses on the relationship between the environment uh -huh. and human health. And the main argument that the report makes is that an unhealthy planet leads to a large percentage of our death and disease. In fact, one fourth of the death and disease that we face is attributable to environmental reasons. And that's the main story of the report. And the other report? The previous reports just looked at the state of the environment. This one looks at the state of the environment in its relationship with health, but it also looks at uh, the policy options. For example, he mentioned electric cars, and in our report we talk about how Norway has one-third of its cars are electric because of the way the government is encouraging um, the re removal of tolls for electric cars, so it's really pushing the electric cars in the, in the Norwegian society. Mr. Birch, do the findings in these kinds of international reports add more urgency to your work or support your work? Yeah, yeah, in general I think they do. Uh, maybe they, they don't, uh, they are not part of the, the, the public uh, national debate enough, but should they, um, sh they should be. Uh, and, and, and a good example, of course, is the UNFCCC report on uh, one and a half degrees uh, warming that came out last year in October. Uh, I think that was a very big deal also in our debates on, on climate change. Uh, and it helps us, um, um, in this case especially, to, tr to stress why one and a half degrees is an important uh, limit for global warming. Um, in our court case against Shell, uh, in lobbying uh, to, the, to the government in all kinds of, of work that we do. 
Professor Gupta, climate change is frequently framed as a global issue requiring a global solution. And in response to this over the past few years, we've seen countries adopt a series of international treaties as part of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. What role has international uh, law played in addressing climate change? International law has been extremely important because basically what happens in a climate negotiation is that you bring all the countries together and you try to educate every country about the problem of climate change, the causes, the impacts, and the measures that you need to take on those issues. And you also try to do it within a certain fair um, process, um, which not only looks at uh, fairness in terms of procedure, but fairness in terms of substance. So you need to bring all the countries together. And for 30 years, we have now been having annual uh, decisions of the Conference of the Parties on this issue. And we also had in 2015 the Paris Agreement. So these agreements really try to create a level playing field between all the countries. Without that, you can't get countries mobilized to take action. But is it fair? I mean, for instance, last year we saw at the Katowice uh, Climate Change Conference in Poland that one of the biggest sort of issues for countries to agree on was providing financial help to poor countries in the developing world. Surely you can see there that it, there isn't this sort of level playing field. There is this difference in, in so developing and developed countries. So from a fairness perspective, Many of the small island states have done nothing to cause this problem, and so therefore they need support in addressing the problem. Um, from a fairness perspective, it's really important that developed countries not only uh, provide resources based on the principle of responsibility, but also because of their capacity to do so. Having said that, what I've noticed is that because the sea level will continue to rise for the next thousand years, most rich countries do not want to make commitments up to the next thousand years. So what they're doing is they're backing off on their responsibilities. And in the Paris Agreement, we say very clearly that uh, uh, rich countries should pay an additional $100 billion per so 20, more, yeah. more money from yeah. 2020 onwards. But that said, in the non-legally binding yeah. part of the treaty, and in the meanwhile, the G7 countries are providing $100 billion in support for fossil fuel. But which then, is completely opposite but then thing. is international law really the most effective method of regulating uh, actions of countries? There's no other alternative. What else can you do? You can talk. But without a, law, a legal process, you're not even going to get that far. I actually don't feel that international law has done that badly. It's taken us 30 years to get all the countries educated on this issue. We're talking about changing our lifestyles. I think we're doing pretty well. But if we look at another criticism that is often levied against international law is that um, it can be subordinate to political and national interests. So Mr. Birch, do you think how stable can international law actually be if it can change within, within a s the snap of a finger if we look at national and political interests? Um, well, you know, uh, f firstly, I, 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 I tend to agree that, you know, uh, what else do we have? So there I think mm -hmm. it's vital uh, to get anywhere uh, together on this planet. Um, but of course, yeah, you, uh, there's, there's big weaknesses to it. Um, and you, you, men you mentioned national and uh, personal interest, uh, but what about corporate interest? So, you know, one, one very uh, uh, problematic thing about international law is that you have hard law that protects the interests of, of, uh, of business or big corporations, like the WTO arbitration mechanisms, for instance, but also uh, these arbitration mechanisms for corporations to sue governments when there's this bil these bilateral investment agreements and stuff like that. And, and all these other uh, kinds of law are all, 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 all forms of soft law. Uh, and it's easy to get out of, it's easy to not comply. Um, uh, and yeah, of course, that's a big problem. But wouldn't you say that also, if we look at Trump, for example, to bring him into this discussion, I think it's unavoidable. I mean, he pulled out of the, the, the Paris Agreement. D doesn't this really downplay the role that international law can play? Technically, I have not found the document in which he has actually pulled the US out. We've heard his announcement. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, it doesn't really matter right now what Trump says, because it's, it's he hopefully he's out very yeah. fast. But the main thing <laughs> to remember is that globally, maybe to get to a two degree target, we have to spend $22 trillion, but we will get a return of $54 trillion. So the returns on an investment in climate change is a lot. And when you were talking about just now with him about national interests, the question is how are national interests calculated? If you just look at your energy sector, you might come up with one sort of answer. Yeah. But if you look at the impacts on your agricultural sector, if you look at the impacts in terms of building all the dikes and dams and dunes in the Netherlands and raising them every year, then maybe it's not quite so straightforward as you think. 
So I think that the way our governments are calculating national interest is skewed towards the interests of the dominant multinationals, and that's a problem. But then, sort of, international law only regulates the uh, actions and behaviors of states. It doesn't have any obligations in any way to corporations. Should we include corporations in these international law negotiations? Should they be allowed to have a seat at the table in these treaties? No, no, you yeah. seem to shake your head. I don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, when it's, uh, for instance, uh, about climate change, mm -hmm. I don't think they should have a seat at the table. And of course, they do have a seat at the table at the moment. And the result is that that uh, that these uh, treaties are not uh, impacting. Uh, are they, they they don't uh, bind these corporations to any. Uh, what do you mean uh, by when they have a seat at the table already? So I mean uh, the 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 climate summits are actually sponsored by fossil fuel companies. You know, they are the ones basically organizing them. Uh, so we are giving them a lot of influence. Mm -hmm. uh, while they they shouldn't be uh, uh, at the s in, uh, at a seat at the table, they should be on the table. They are the topic we are talking about. They are the problem. And do you agree with this? Um, I'm not entirely sure what he meant by the, the climate. Um, but to be, uh, the negotiations are funded by states, not by the industries but they are present during the negotiation processes and they are so obviously present that they influence the way countries negotiate. But I think you can control the behavior of corporations through governments. So you can tell governments that you need to take care of the um, multinationals that have headquarters in those particular countries. So that's the way to deal with it because if you try to talk with multinationals, because they're so much richer than states, they can manipulate the whole process. But wouldn't you agree that because, of, because they're causing a lot of damage, it's obvious that corporations and multinationals are actually very much responsible for climate change. Wouldn't you agree that this actually increases the need for them to be at these negotiations? Uh, uh, they are at the negotiations. Yes. But that's the problem, because even though you have also the civil society at the negotiations, the multinationals have so much money, they can actually influence the way governments are negotiating. So suppose I want to phone uh, the Dutch prime minister, he's hardly going to pick up my phone. If I'm the CEO of Shell, he will. You know, it, it's a different storyline, so they have a direct line to the people in power, and that is a very big challenge. So we can't afford to have them as a negotiator because they will change the dynamics of the discussion, which is exactly what he was trying to bring forward. So, and, and, and maybe to add to that, uh, uh, d just looking at how these big co uh, corporations have acted uh, uh, within uh, these negotiations, within so society positioning themselves on climate change and on other topics, you see that uh, uh, companies like Shell and Exxon uh, have been casting doubt on the science, uh, have been delaying all kinds of uh, policy. Have m they, are, they are making us believe that, uh, that it's not realistic to go f that, uh, as fast as we should. Um, and and they're succeeding in that. They have succeeded in that for the last 30 years or longer. Mm -hmm. Well, as we saw a couple weeks ago here in Amsterdam, a lot of people share your concerns. People were protesting in the rain in Dam Square, up to 40,000, I think. Do you think that the, these protests, these kinds of protests, are they legitimate? Are the people's concerns proportionate to the severity of the issue? Or, as some people would say, they're just overreacting? Mr. Bershk. I think it's, I think uh, they, I was also there, so, but we, in a sense, we are underreacting. Underreacting? Um, yeah, because, you know, we, we, if you look at the science, if you really let the science, you know, get through to you, uh, it's it's absurd how how far we have we have come so far that that we haven't done much more much sooner. Uh, we are we are taking risk like you know if we do almost you know basically the most that we could do right now these scenarios that we that could commit us to uh, maximum 1.5 degrees of warming. Um, that's still you know the, the one of the some of the most optimistic scenarios still only gives us about 85 percent chance to commit to stay within that 1.5 degrees which is what the science uh, uh, says is uh, the upper safe limit so what do you say we could be doing at the grassroots level to put more pressure on our governments what's what more can we do other than protesting on dam square uh, maybe we should uh, organize general strikes. Um, I mean, ad the, so the, what's ab absolutely hopeful is the, the movement of, of, of young people, of, of uh, yeah. uh, school striking. You know, uh, the like Greta I, I Thunberg, for example. S sorry. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, they had. Uh, they also had on uh, last uh, Thursday. They had this big uh, international climate strike day with 
uh, with big protests all around uh, the world, basically. Um, and that is really starting to become a really big, powerful movement. So and it's also, you know, it's it's driving uh, also, you know, us as the as the, the grown-ups to do to do more, to organize uh, more protests, to to um, to be uh, harder on governments and corporations. Uh, yeah, they are a very powerful force, I think. And what do you think, Professor Gupta? I think that's fantastic. Uh, last week in. Um, uh, Nairobi, um, a German young girl spoke to the United Nations Environment Assembly of 70 ministers and 195 countries, and she simply said to them that, uh, you know, we are 50% of the population today and 100% of the population tomorrow, and you guys have failed us. So it's absolutely essential to come back to his point. If you continue like we are doing right now, the two degree target will be passed by in 20 years. So we really have, there's an urgency, we really have to move fast. And um, that, that is very true, and I think um, there's many ways that we, we can do that. I think one, one, one way that we haven't addressed yet is climate litigation. Now, during, during the process of this interview, we, of course, we looked at a lot of articles, and they all talked about climate litigation. So, Mr. Bursch, could you explain to us what climate litigation involves? Yeah, uh, so, you know, basically it's uh, holding governments or, or corporations accountable uh, you know, holding them liable in, in, in legal terms for the, the climate impact that they uh, that they are having. I mean, you can have m you know many different uh, avenues to approach it. Mm -hmm. um, we are uh, so we are have, have uh, announced that we will sue uh, Shell uh, for their climate damages. Uh, we will uh, officially start this case on April fifth, um, and uh, what we argue is that they um, that they are breaching their duty of care. Uh, this duty of care in the Dutch um, uh, law is, is this open norm, and uh, our argument is that uh, the, the Paris Climate Agreement and also European uh, 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 human rights um, are, uh, you can see that as a, as a standard, as a norm in our society of what you, know, what is, uh, what you should comply to to be responsible. So if you don't uh, comply to it, you are breaching your duty of care and you're, uh, you know, you're, uh, that, that means a violation of, of Dutch law. Can uh, climate change be framed as a violation of our human rights? Sure. Do you think? Yeah. Yes. I mean, there are, me there are human rights at stake when, uh, you know, when, when our livelihoods are at stake, when, uh, when, our, when our food system uh, uh, is under pressure, when uh, sea levels are rising and people have to, have to move, or, you know, th so many reasons uh, how, how they can uh, breach a human rights. Should we also promote it as that? I think we should use the entire arsenal of international law and national law mm -hmm. to sue these companies or the governments. And what you're finding is that in, in terms of the legal storyline, there's a question about who can go to court. So normally you have to demonstrate that you've been actually affected very badly before you can go to court. Yeah. But now we are finding that young people are going to court even before they can prove damage based on the IPCC reports or other scientific reports. And these young people are doing that not just in the United States, in Pakistan, in India, now in the European Union. So youth are going to court. Uh, the next question is, who can you sue? And in general, you can sue a government. So in the Netherlands, you can sue the Dutch government or you can sue the US government in the US. But now you can even sue the World Bank and the IFC because uh, a group of Indians have gone to the United States courts to ask whether they can sue the World Bank there. And that has now been approved because up till now, the international banking system said, oh, we are above the law, we don't have to be, we cannot be sued anywhere. And this is about investing in fossil fuels in India. So who can you sue? What kind of arguments can you take up? Everything from human rights to duty of care, which falls under tortious law. Uh, but you can also sue uh, governments, um, companies on the, under Freedom of Information Act. Uh, you can sue them under environment impact assessment. So a number of these issues are being brought up. So it's really exciting right now. So I, I think you, do you agree then that this is the best way to solve the climate issue? It's based on the idea of uh, balance of power. You have a legislature, mm -hmm. you have an executive, you have a judiciary. The legislature unfortunately comes for a very short period of time and everybody wants to be re-elected so they don't want to take unpopular topics. The judiciary, generally speaking, is not affected by short-term politics. And that's why the judiciary can take a longer-term perspective. So, I mean, I think all three have a role to play yeah. and right now, right now we have to use the judiciary. And what about you, Mr. Bursch? Yeah, so, um, uh, I, I actually think uh, it's absolutely not the best way to solve the problem. What is the best way then? Well, the best way would be that governments and corporations would take responsibility without them being pressured by a judge. 
Um, but they're not doing that at the moment. Yeah. So, so we have to resort to these kinds of measures. No, no, that, 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 that it's a serious point, though. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, a, cor a court case is, I think, in, uh, in, in uh, maybe almost any mm -hmm. case, a sort of last resort. Yeah. You don't want to sue uh, a government or a corporation. You do it because you think you have to. But given the circumstances, what is then the best way that we can solve this climate issue? Yes, well, I th I th we need many ways. Uh, I think litigation is a very strong uh, way, al although you know it has to prove itself. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we have seen the, the Dutch uh, case against the state being successful, and that, of course, is a very big victory. Uh, but we'll have to see if other cases will be uh, just as, as successful and as impactful. Um, but I think it's uh, um, absolutely a good idea to try. Mm -hmm. uh, but next to that, of course, we also still need to um, you know, go out in the streets and protest our governments. Um, uh, um, and, and also you know, organize ourselves in local energy uh, corporations. So many, many things that, that have to contribute to, uh, to, the, to the solutions. Yeah. Uh, well, now I think it's a good time to open up the floor for an audience question. Are there anyone? Oh, yes, immediately there. We can have the microphone to the... Ma Hello. Uh, you briefly uh, touched on about bilateral investment treaties and uh, maybe the investment dispute <coughs> mechanisms that are within them. Uh, these have, like, as you probably know, they've increased massively in the past couple of decades and they're becoming really influential. Uh, one of the uh, problems that have many people have said are associated with them is the fact that they can uh, stymie a lot of environmental policy of governments. So how do you see uh, governments pursuing radical environmental policy that's necessary while still within this regime which requires massive amounts of compensation for the damages to investors' uh, pr uh, capital? Should I? So the problem with the bilateral investment treaties is a, they freeze uh, environmental policy. And that has to do with the fact that uh, when a contract is made across uh, two parties, it may be made for the next 30 years, and it's very often highly secret. And so it's not open to public scrutiny. And when there is a court case, that also is often very secret. And I've heard a lot of problems with the Energy Charter Agreement, which in fact makes it very difficult to close down an energy company. And Mrs. Uh, Merkel in Germany is being sued because she's trying to close down the nuclear power companies. So what you're seeing is that this is a real challenge for um, trying to change these issues. Um, there's no easy solution to this, but I'm really hoping on the one hand that we do not get the developing countries to become party to the Energy Charter Agreement because it will bind them to these bilateral investment treaties. But more than that, I'm also hoping that all topics, all issues that concern the air, the water, the land, all of these should be transparent so that contracts made on these topics should not be kept secret. Of course, that means opening up contract law. And that means it's a big fight because there's a lot of money in all these uh, contracts. So it's not going to be an easy battle. It's going to be a difficult battle. And one of the ways I think we need to solve this is to try to prevent these new bilateral investments in new oil, new fossil fuel in the developing world made with uh, companies like Shell. Do you think that companies like Shell need to disclose their CO2 track records? They have to, I think they must be forced to disclose their track records, but they're not willing, they are quite willing to make a carbon disclosure, mm -hmm. but they're not always willing to show exactly what their contracts mean in terms of CO2, water, air, land, you know, it's, it's not just CO2, it's the whole spectrum. And all these issues are linked up together. So that's why I think it's really important that the contracts become open, but they're not making them open yet. So more transparency in corporations. Absolutely. So now for this next part of the interview, we're gonna ask, an essential question that's part of any trial is who is to blame? And for this purpose, we're going to read to you three statements and we'd like you to either agree or disagree with these statements. And then we'll go into more depth as to why. So the first statement is corporations are the biggest players when it comes to climate change. Yes. Agree? I Mr. agree. Bersk? Agree. Why, Mr. Bersk? Well, um, you could say, uh, you know, uh, sort of officially, uh, it all lies with governments. Um, but you see in practice that, you know, uh, uh, like you mentioned before, uh, s uh, some corporations are bigger than, than a lot of governments these days. And they're, they've been cre become increasingly powerful. And uh, to hold governments accountable, we have democracy, we have, uh, we have uh, law. Uh, corporations, holding corporations accountable is much harder. So that's, that's why I think there is the big problem. 
What did you agree? I, I agree, and if I just take, uh, for example, the case of Shell, mm -hmm. when I first came to the Netherlands in 1988 and I worked for the Ministry of Environment, Shell knew at that time about climate change. Yes. And we, they were in long discussions with them about what needs to happen. And we're still in discussions with them about what needs to happen. They have the knowledge, they have the expertise, they have the money, they can do it. They can lead us. But last year I heard a radio interview where the person in charge of Shell said that what can I do? The Dutch people want to use uh, fossil fuels, but the Dutch people only want to press the electricity button, you know, in their mm -hmm. the, the switch, and get electricity. They don't care where it comes from. They want to be able to drive. They don't care if it is a gas car or an electric car. So Shell could have led. Yeah. But, but interesting that you may... Oh, no, but the Dutch people do care about how much they spend. I mean, renewable energy, electric cars, these are expensive, yes expensive and no. things. Th th I, I don't agree with that because I know that from 2000 and till 2017, um, uh, uh, I have paid my energy company a surplus mm -hmm. for renewable energy. So I paid a, a tax on my renewable energy instead of getting a discount because I'm not causing the CO2 problem. Whereas most people are getting the normal electricity and they are being subsidized by the Dutch government on the CO2 or the climate impacts. So it's the way you count uh, your GDP or the way you count your mm -hmm. profits that's critical. But if we look at Shell, for example, I mean, you see them in their sky scenario, they published that they're going to invest one to two billion euros in green energy and that they are actually um, trying or, or in accordance with the Paris Agreement. Isn't this evidence enough that they are doing something to address these issues? What? So, so they're, they're investing 25 to 28 b billion a year in fossil fuels. Yes. That makes them probably one of the biggest problems in the world because there's, there, there are not much other companies that so many uh, money to spend uh, expanding the problem instead of the solution. But what is interesting is that um, I spoke to Marianne van Loon in September, on also on the stage, and she said that we all have to do it together. Do you think that this is more of a delaying tactic or yes. delay or, you know, shifting the blame? Yes, because individuals can't do very much. A colleague of mine just wrote a piece in which he calculated that if um, the Dutch green people, so the people yeah. in the Netherlands, uh, if they would all invest in green energy and fly less, etc., etc., how much would it be in relation to the Shell's uh, uh, footprint? And it turned out that it was less than 1% of Shell's greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. So the question is, you know, we can all do our part. We should all do our part. Yeah. But the big companies have to take responsibility. They have also huge profits. It's not like they you know, not ha don't have any profits. Should they be a leader in this of transition course. as well? Of course. So, Mr. Bursch, I guess this is probably why you're bringing a case against Shell. Could yeah. you briefly explain to our audience the specifics of your case? Um, yeah, so, um, uh, so my, my, my legal English is, is a bit lacking, so maybe, I, I'm, maybe I'll have to look for words a bit. But, you know, I, ex I explained a bit on, on the duty of care, right? So, mm -hmm. um, what uh, we, we argue that they are breaching this duty of care, that they have to, um, um, you know, that... that the, that they, if they continue doing what they do, uh, then there will be uh, damages for which they uh, should be held liable. Uh, so they should take precautionary um, uh, measures to prevent that. So what we demand also is, is we don't demand uh, money. We don't demand compensation yeah, for the damages that they already did. You demand did. performance, right? Sorry? You demand performance, a certain performance. Yeah, yeah we demand... How come, actually? So, so our demand uh, uh, is, is strictly that, that they... Um, that they uh, commit their business to a net zero CO2 emissions by 2050, which is, you know, compliant to the uh, 1.5 uh, degree scenarios of the IPCC, uh, and with an intermediate uh, target of 45% uh, in 2030. Um, yeah, basically, uh, that's what it comes down to. And, uh, yeah, we, we bring the human rights, the Paris Agreement, to argue um, uh, why, why uh, they have to do this. And, uh, yeah, that's the basic. But so Go ahead. No, it, it's. Um, I just think you mentioned that you mentioned that it's only going to be in 2050, which is I'm going to be 51 years old at that point. Yeah. Wh why is it taking such a long time? Yeah, <laughs> good question. <laughs> um, well, so that's why we have the intermediate goal because we, um, you know, uh, in, a, in a sense, these these um, uh, reduction targets by 2030 and 2050. Uh, are of course uh, not not the perfect way to um, to measure it. The, the carbon budgets would be better. You know, just say, knowing that so we ca we can 
the atmosphere can have so much more uh, carbon um, uh, until we reach uh, a certain amount of warming. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, that's just not the way internationally it's calculated. So we have to have these percentages. Um, uh, and that, you know, there's there, there, there we see a legal base to, um, to sue them. Professor Gupta, what do you think of this? I think it's a very good idea, and I think that they also allow everyone to become a plaintiff, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, so you have to pay a thanks small for amount. mentioning that. <laughs> and so you really... So, yeah, yeah. Uh, klimaatzaakshel.nl, it's uh, the website. And, uh <laughs> and we, should, we should actually um, uh, ensure that people all over the world join, and maybe you give a discount to people in the small island states, mm -hmm. because they really need to join. So at the number of people we can get onto this case makes it much more uh, strong in terms of the voice of the people of the world. Um, so I think we have a very strong um, position here and of course it's what's what's really special is that in the Netherlands we have a um, civil law country where the judges are not very creative like in the common law countries in British system or in the American system or in the Indian system the judges can afford to be more creative than in the civil law countries and yet this case is coming up in a civil law country which is in one of the most conservative legal systems or judiciaries mm. in the world so in that sense it's brilliant because all the other countries will follow after that but specifically here, you mentioned that one of the legal arguments you're depending on is this duty of care, yeah. which of course was the same argument used in your agenda case yeah. uh, in 2015. I mean, it's easier to prove a duty of care when it's the government and its people. How, how likely do you think it will be for the duty of care to be proven with a corporation like Shell? It doesn't, the thing is it might take time. If you look at the cigarette smoking case, it took us almost 40 years before the companies took responsibility in the United States. And they're still selling cigarettes in the South uh, as if nothing had ever happened on this particular topic. It may take time, but the question is now, because we have so much more, uh, more people, the, the, the innovative nature of the plaintiff system in this particular case, but we have more people worldwide involved, it might go faster. So we might lose this one. But if we get these kinds of cases worldwide, we have around two and a half thousand cases worldwide on these issues. We are going to get a movement, yeah. but we have to keep the pressure up. You just mentioned the tobacco industry, and I mean, as you said, there's still people smoking, the cigarettes are still being sold, however, there's still, uh, there was still a huge backlash, and there's still people quitting every day. Do you in think the South. In the South, yes. But do you think that this is also the big tobacco moment for the oil industry? I think it is, and that's one of the reasons I think that uh, we have to do all we can to help get the plaintiff numbers up to about 3 billion. I don't know where you are right now, but you need 15, to make 15,000. <laughs> that's not oh, yeah. <laughs> We really have to move the process up, and we may have to get all the universities mobilized. And that part of it may be that because you have to pay this $10 or whatever it is you have to mm. pay. One euro. <laughs> One euro, <laughs> whatever. So maybe that should be possible. But I, you know, the, the idea is to get more people mobilized on this case. And most people don't know in the South that they can participate in this case. Yeah, so b to be clear, um, to become an official co-plaintiff, you have to be a Dutch citizen. So uh, there is this, you have, we have this uh, sort of support side from our International Friends of the Earth uh, network where everyone can support. And that's, that's free, that you know, everybody can, uh, uh, what, what we call an honorary co-plaintiff. Um, but to be an official co-plaintiff, you have to be resident in the Netherlands. So, so you know, anybody ha that lives here, that you don't have to have a passport in the Netherlands, but you have to live here, <laughs> and then you can join. But in the honorary co-plaintiffs, if you can get a large mobilized, uh, mobilization of people, it makes it very difficult for a judge to ignore that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now moving on to our second statement. Governments are doing enough to adequately address climate change. Agree, disagree? Well, disagree. <laughs> disagree. I mean, it's, it's easy, right? Uh, as long as we're not on a path to, uh, to, uh, to get uh, the Paris climate goals, we're not doing enough. So the thing is, in a neoliberal world where governments sort of take uh, the back seat, yeah. they can justify their lack of action based on the idea that, you know, uh, we have to wait for everyone to take an action. So but we disagree with the statement. No, I think governments, can, yes, I, I mean, okay. I, governments have to do much more. Yes. And I think we have to move away from the neoliberal framing of these kinds of problems. All right. So, do you think then that, how much of the responsibility then for climate change can we put on governments? I mean, that was one of the arguments in the agenda case. The agenda foundation argued that governments had systematic responsibility for climate change. Yeah. Does that mean 100% responsibility or 70%? Well, if you, if you account for the, the lack of responsibility they took for the last uh, decades, uh, maybe 200, 300 <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I think they're very responsible because they're the ones who make the roads, the trains, you know, public transport, that's part of their responsibility. Energy systems, their responsibility. Um, in terms of agriculture also, there are emissions. So the state can do a lot if it chooses to. And without it costing them in terms of GDP losses, if you look at Germany and you look at uh, China, they've invested so much in renewables, but their GDP hasn't gone down. So it's, it's a question of how you think about it. But if we go back to the Agenda Foundation for a second, and the Agenda case, you see these, um, in the court documents, they mentioned that uh, the Dutch government is in a sort of pr prisoner's dilemma, where they're locked down um, because, of they, because they have a short-term economic vision or short-term economic interests. Do you agree with that? Do you think that they do find themselves in this prisoner's dilemma? I think the politicians may have a short-term interest. Yes. But the government... Because of the election cycle. Right. But the government is not just politicians. It's also the executive, it's the judiciary, it's the, you know, it's all of us. I mean, we're all part of the system. So it's extremely stupid to only look at a short-term cycle. Mm -hmm. So I personally feel that's one of the reasons why we need the judiciary, because they have a longer-term perspective. But I think the executive, the administrators, they need to get more active. We shouldn't be just prisoners of, it's like guest minister, you know, that uh, the British uh, <laughs> show, you know, what <laughs> the minister wants, yes. You have to explain to the minister you got it wrong. And Mr. Bush, do you think that, that the Dutch government finds itself in this prisoner's dilemma? Um, I, I think it's a false argument. Um, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. there you hear a lot of arguments that if we do too much, then, uh, then our companies will move yeah. elsewhere. But the Netherlands is, is uh, hanging somewhere at the, at the bottom of these rankings about on CO2 reduction, on sustainable energy. Uh, so um, at the moment, uh, w we are in, in the prisoner's dilemma, we are the country where other uh, uh, companies should, sh uh, would be going to uh, if the theory is correct. And do you think that this, how, how can we get out of this prisoner's dilemma then? If they find themselves stuck in it or in this vision, even if you think it's false, how do they get out of it? How can how can we resolve well, this? Have a, have a vision on uh, on economic well on economic growth uh, is not uh, I don't think it's the right term but on, on sustainable development mm -hmm. um, you know that on, on development that is sustainable uh, on 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 uh, uh, having uh, business and um, 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 uh, getting getting business to come to the Netherlands or whatever um, that that is sustainable that is based on um, you know what you could call uh, this the, the the new economy where there were sustainable energy and circular economy and all those things that we need to um, you know to have a good life but still respect the, the limits of the planet uh, um, is, is is the limits. Okay, I think that there is. One, I mean, we now we've addressed corporations, we've addressed governments. I think that there's one factor or one group that we haven't addressed yet, and that is us as individuals. So for our third statement, we have the individual holds the ultimate responsibility when it comes to climate change. Do you agree or disagree? I would argue that individuals need to go on a CO2 diet, on a methane <laughs> diet, on a plastic <laughs> diet. So, you know, don't buy straws, don't buy plastic forks, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So we need to do our bit, but we can't change the system alone, except in terms of social movements and going to court to force the companies to change. So you disagree with the statement? I think all of us have the role, the government, the private sector, the individual. But who leads in this? I think the government leads in this, and the private uh, individuals must form the social movements. So the ultimate responsibility then lies not with us, but with these corporations I and think the governments? I think the question is wrong. I think the okay. question is, uh, who should give leadership? The state mm -hmm. should give leadership. Who should push them to show leadership? We should push them to show leadership. Yeah? Yes. So it, it's, 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 a, it's a dance where we are all involved. It's not like, you know, um, it's a dictatorial system, let the state do something. No, but we have to push them to behave. So you disagree with the fundamentals of the, of the state? Of the question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and what about you, Mr. Bursch? Yeah, so um, uh, in, in the Netherlands, in the 80s and 90s, we had this uh, government campaign uh, and beter milieu begins by yourself. A, a better yeah. environment starts with yourself. And this sort of embodies this idea that uh, I think in the Netherlands, but in many other countries, have been uh, you know, very dominant in our way of thinking how should we deal with these ecological problems. And I think, it's, um, I, I think it has set us back instead of help us. Uh, it has, is, it, it has um, given people, individual people, the, the idea that we have to feel guilty for every bad thing that we do. Mm -hmm. That if we don't recycle enough, if we uh, take the car, um, uh, you know, uh, all, that all these choices uh, that we are doing, uh, that we are making the bad choices, 
um, while well, we should have been focusing on collective solutions. You know, it's a collective problem. We have need collective solutions. And of course, we all have a responsibility there, uh, but not as an individual. Sure, it helps, you know, it, it all helps if we uh, eat less meat and more uh, uh, plant-based options. Um, that's all important, but we, do, we shouldn't feel guilty. But you know, there's this, uh, in, in social psychology, you have this, mm -hmm. um, uh, this principle of, you know, when, when uh, the, the people's beliefs and people's actions don't match when they are in conflict with each other, um, people tend to change not their actions, but their beliefs. So I, I, it could be possible that this state of mind, this frame of, uh, on, on uh, climate change, on, on ecological problems, has, has helped people be skeptic about climate change, skeptic about the need to, uh, to address these problems. Can I explain yes, this course. with an example? So I work at the UVA and I also work one day a week at Delft, yeah. UNESCO IHA. In Delft what they did was they took out all the plastic cups and they gave us instead porcelain cups and we are instructed to keep the cup the whole day and at the end of the day to bring it for washing. And therefore, they just don't have any plastic cups at the end of the day. And at the Uber, in our canteens and everywhere, we have it's plastic cups. Plastic, yeah. Get rid of the cups, get the porcelain cups, and everybody, you know, it's just small things. But this requires the Uber to take action. But don't you think that if we have this sense of guilt, as you explained, you, you said it was a negative thing, but, it, but, but, but don't you think that if we have this sense of guilt, actually, when we buy something that in contains plastic, if we have that plastic straw, for example, that actually prevents us, that sense of guilt prevents us from doing these actions and therefore makes us or leads us to a more sustainable direction? No, because he's right, you know. I've tried very hard at one point of time in my life to get to zero you know, um, zero, waste. zero everything. Yeah. And that doesn't work. It basically means I have to sit in my underpants like <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi, and that doesn't work, <laughs> you know? Because every time when I'm washing my clothes, okay, I wash at then 30 degrees instead of 60 degrees. Um, I wash less than I do. I, I take a shower of two minutes instead of 10 minutes. But you know, it becomes, life becomes boring if every action you take has to be calculated. And in that sense, I agree with him. Then I think, oh, you know, well, forget it because I but can't But given the severity of climate change, I mean, in your report, you say that we have 12 years left. Shouldn't this be on our mind constantly? Yes, but even if it's on our mind, and I gave you the example before, yeah. even if it's on our mind, the chances are that we won't be able to solve it ourselves. I can't change the private, uh, private car system in the Netherlands. I can't make sure that everywhere in the Netherlands there's going to be an electric place where I can plug in. The only thing I can do is probably uh, make sure that I have solar panels on my roof mm -hmm. no? or, or cook on electric things. So there are limits to what we can do. But essentially what we need over here is guidance from the state, very clear guidance, leadership, a willingness to dare, and our politicians don't dare enough. You know, of course, this is also, you can see this as a moral question. Yeah. I think it's maybe more a practical question. So it doesn't work to put the responsibility with individuals. Uh, we have seen that for the last couple of decades. It simply doesn't work. If we have to wait until every individual decides to live 100% sustainable, uh, you know, um, it'll be way too late. It will be centuries away from now. Uh, so basically, you know, it's, it's uh, the choice, do we want to solve this problem or do we want to uh, s stick with these moral questions? All right, and I think that is actually a perfect transition to um, w w taking action, which is something that we also want to touch upon. I mean, climate change is a very complex issue and we need to find many ways to solve this. Do you think that, don't you agree that, or don't you think that climate change is better dealt with through the legislative branch? rather than a judicial one. Balance of power, you need Balance all of three. Power. Each yeah. country will have different dynamics. So if it is possible... And in the Netherlands then? In the Netherlands right now, we have to go to court because the state is not doing enough. Okay, and right now there's a discussion about climate change, so it's come onto the agenda a little bit more. But you need all the pressure you can in the Netherlands to make sure that we move to the next stage. But each country has a different sense of balance of power. In China, perhaps you don't want to go to court because in, in the state is trying to lead there in some ways. In India, going to court is perfect. So, you know, it's each country has its different dynamics. But in the Netherlands, for example, I mean, uh, criticism that was levied against the agenda case, for example, was that the judiciary or that the judicial branch actually overstepped its line. No, that, that's because the, of but the civil law system. In the civil law system, we don't want creative judges. But if you go from balance of power, mm -hmm. if the politicians don't do enough, the judges should step up. That's my belief. So we need the trias politica, you yes. know, that each party must step up when the other party is not. But then that's quite a, a high... 
it's, that's there you see there the judicial branch essentially making policy for the government. So that's what? a responsibility. No, they're not. They're, they're not. not. They are based. The, the only thing that the judge has said in the Urgenda case is that uh, the government has set these targets for themselves to have a 25 to 40 percent reduction in 2020. The only thing the judge has said: if you commit to that, do it. That's the only thing. But they did use the IPCC report in the previous version, and so they did. I mean, they have tried to use some amount of uh, their understanding of the issue to put pressure on the state. And in principle, I think there's nothing wrong with that because what they're doing is they're checking the uh, way the politicians are looking at decisions against the science and against judicial principles of fairness. So if you look in India, a few years ago, there was a court case where people said, we're getting a lot of pollution in the air and everybody's mm -hmm. dying, and therefore we need to make sure that the buses move to compress natural gas. And then the court decided that, and it forced the government of India to change the bus fleet in New Delhi. So do you think that urgency is like, c because of its urgency, it is then justified? Because it is just, mm -hmm. because it is science-based. Okay. You know, yeah. and it is the b it is it is the balance of power. But that was one of the interesting things about the agenda case was that neither side, not agenda, neither the state of the Netherlands disagreed with the findings in the IPCC report. So why even go to court? I mean, if everyone agrees on the science, because of of the need for the the. Because you want to put pressure on the state to take more action. I think one of the arguments made in the first round of the Akenda case mm -hmm. was whether the Dutch government could argue that because other countries are not taking measures, therefore we can delay action. And somewhere in that report, there is this notion that you can't wait just because other countries aren't taking action. You have a responsibility of your own. So you can't use the free rider concept. So, you know, it's, it's, it's basically putting pressure. Putting pressure. And Taking it back to the, no, staying on the agenda case, um, in the upcoming case against Royal Dutch Shell and taking the agenda case as an example, do you think that it can actually lead to effective and concrete change? Um, well, you know, the, I hope so. Um, mm -hmm. You see the, 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 the matter with the agenda case right now is that, um, that the government is, is, is giving signals that they might not be able to um, to uh, have the, uh, the action that uh, the, the judge has uh, committed them to. Um, you know, so that's, that's of course a difficult thing with these, these kind of cases is that it's, it's not so easy to, to really uh, uh, force them if they decide that they don't want to listen to what the judge says. Yes, but then India is much further ahead than the Netherlands because <laughs> in India the court <laughs> said to the government you're in contempt of court because you did not change the buses right. immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So the gov government was punished by the court and the court had the judgment, the, the government had to then change its behavior faster. So, you know, you see that there is at least in, in with all its limitations, there's more balance of power yeah. than there than in the Netherlands. But I'm hopeful. I'm sure we will, if we I get our act together in time, we will be able to make the change we want. So if we look at the Hemweg, coal mine, for example, I mean, that's closing down and that is a process that was sped up by the agenda case. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So yeah. But so it's still, it's not enough for them to, to no. get uh, to the goals that they set. No, because if we look at the climate accord, for example, I mean, Eric Wiebes presented the climate accord last week on our stage as well. And it seems, and, and recent criticism has, has shown that they will not actually reach their goals. They will not reach the goals that they set for themselves by 2020. Is climate, is climate litigation then really effective? Yeah, I mean, if the if the case wouldn't have been there, uh, yeah. the, the, the they, they would be even, even it would be even worse. Yeah, I, I I I do believe so, and they they will probably still come up with uh, other measures to get closer to the mm -hmm. goal. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, that's that's it's also still a, a part of politics, of course. Uh, they will have debates among the the coalition um, uh, among the parties that are uh, in power. Um, what can they do? Uh, how much should they do? Uh, but the fact that the judge has, has, has made this verdict um, really puts pressure on them to also commit to them, at, you know, hopefully all the way, but uh, at least uh, part of the way. Well, climate litigation deals on a case-by-case -case basis, bringing lawsuits to individual governments and corporations one at a time. I mean, how effective is this really, fighting climate change one legal battle at a time? I mean, at what point does it end? Mr. Burr, for instance. Well, yeah, you have uh, you have something uh, that's uh, called uh, a, a pr setting a precedence, right? So if, if one case uh, is won, uh, it, it should make other new cases easier to also win. Well, um, not in a civil law system like we have here in the Netherlands. They 
I mean, the, the Urkenda case is, is uh, referenced in, in other cases around the world. So, you know, in that sense, um, I, I don't know how much it helps, but I think it helps. It also helps uh, in the debate, in the state of mind that we have on what's needed to, to tackle ch climate change and uh, in, in believing that a, climate, that a climate case can actually uh, have an impact. So, I mean, you see that the after the, the first verdict uh, that uh, Urgenda won in the first instance, um, that was the inspiration for many other climate cases mm -hmm. to, uh, to start in the rest of the world. Do you think it created this domino effect? Yeah. Yes. So, if we look at the Juliana case in the US, for example, do you see how many more cases can we expect? Um, there, yeah, there, there what can we hope for? Maybe, maybe you know more about the numbers. There are, there are so many cases uh, at the moment. Yeah, uh, there are more than 2,500 cases worldwide on mm -hmm. climate change alone and it's just increasing every single day because people are just borrowing ideas from other cases and bringing court cases everywhere. Uh, the point I'm trying to make in this whole storyline is litigation is really important. Yeah. Litigation comes to a judiciary which has a longer term perspective unless of course the politicians choose the judges which happens in some countries and you need everyone. You cannot solve the climate change problem if you don't have leadership from the top, if you don't have pushing, uh, people pushing from the bottom, so the social movements, mm -hmm. the NGOs, and the court cases. So you need everybody at all the different levels, and you need to get the universities to demand for change. And you guys, you <laughs> should get the University of Amsterdam to go for a zero a greenhouse gas footprint. We you should put the university on trial. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it will be our next session. Nice. But you just mentioned that there's 2,005 other cases, correct? Do you think that the agenda and, and that these cases borrow from other cases? Is, is the agenda case a recipe that can be recreated in other cases? It can be, but uh, there are different types of court cases yes. and different types of courts against different types of defendants and by different types of plaintiffs. So what you need is that multiplicity. Of course, the agenda case can give inspiration to many other court cases, but the mon many of the cases I've seen are also just with respect to energy companies and also their local air pollution. So it's not almost always that climate change is the argument that is running these cases. But I'm sure Agenda will, Agenda will uh, provide inspiration for many, just like the youth cases in uh, America, Pakistan, and India mm -hmm. also provide uh, inspiration for youth cases in other parts of the world. But is there a risk that all this climate litigation could kickstart a series of tortious lawsuits? I mean, corporations have legitimate expectations when they make investments, and when a policy changes, maybe through the agenda case, that can be to their detriment. I mean, what, what's to stop Shell now from suing the Dutch government for changing its climate policy as a result of the agenda case? Well, they probably could, uh, for instance, by with the, the, through these investment treaties or you know, also in domestic law. That, but, you know, the um, uh, le legitimate expectation should be of Shell that we're going to stop using oil and gas. You know, that's uh, see, uh, looking at the climate science at the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. Since the, the Paris Climate Agreement, they still are investing in oil and gas way more than that they know is possible within the, 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 the targets of this uh, Paris Agreement. So their legitimate expectation should be that they have to uh, phase out these oil and gas projects as fast as possible. But do you, yes? Uh, you Go see, ahead. if you are a private sector company and you make an ugly pair of shoes with holes in them, you know which one I'm talking about, <laughs> then at some point people say <laughs> it is ugly and they don't use it anymore and the company may go bankrupt, right? Yes. So the thing is that when people decide they don't want a product and the company goes bankrupt as a consequence, that companies accept and it's part of creative destruction that Schumpeter talks about in his book. The problem is when the state tries to make policy based on science, then companies feel that somehow they can fight against the state. Now, in the medicinal world, when companies got permission to sell a medicine because the company gave evidence that the medicine was good for people, and then later on people decided that the medicine was not good, you could not sue the government, you could sue the company. And I think that's something that has to come in the environmental world as well, so that when companies go bankrupt because or, or, or lose profits because environmental science shows us that it causes issues, then we have to have a change in the way we think. So it's more or less the same argument, different angle. I mean, I guess you just referenced the company Crocs. Yes, I <laughs> yes. just Crocs. But do you think that, uh, staying on corporations for a second, do you think that there's still room for unsustainable corporations in the future? 
there will always be unsustainable uh, corporations and that's because the knowledge so let me just give you an example of uh, chemicals we have 100000 chemicals in use today in the world of which more than half have not been researched for their impacts on human beings and that's not being controlled by the state so what's happening is we will always have unsustainable companies okay. but we have to start dealing with the unsustainable ones that we know already and make sure that they become sustainable all right i think that this is a nice point to turn to the audience are there any audience questions right now i see one right next to you uh, hello, my name is Claudia Klonowska and I'm the UN Youth Delegate of Poland and I had the pleasure to actually participate at COP24 and I want to make a comment and uh, ask you later for the opinion. Uh, there was a very interesting discussion that we had with the politicians uh, from the European countries with the young leaders and one of the reasons why they said they don't act as fast as we wanted them to was that the the society was not educated enough so they said when we do implement these changes they said people will will fire back uh, they said they're not aware why we're making them uh, even though they're aware of climate change they might not be aware why this or other uh, political change is needed uh, to or implemented to to make it better so to what extent do you think that this uh, political excuse actually holds true go ahead um I don't think it holds true. So what happens is, the question is, is, is a politician making a decision because the people want him to take decisions? Or is he taking a decision because he's influenced by science? Is a journalist covering an issue because they think it's important or because the prime minister says it's important or because the people are saying it's important? Everyone can find excuses for themselves as to what can be done. What is really important is that you don't pass the burden of the costs of taking measures to those who cannot afford it. So you pass the burden of the costs of measures to those who can afford it, which is why we are focusing on the large multinationals. But the moment you make everybody on the street pay more for their renewable energy, it's going to be a problem. But if you actually incorporate the price of the climate impacts into your fossil fuel bills, then you have to pay extra for the normal energy and the renewables become cheaper and suddenly everybody will start to buy renewables. So it's really a question of leadership. That's a bad excuse. Thank you for that audience question. Unfortunately, we are nearing the end of our time here, but I would just like to end on one note. Given the increasing prominence of international environmental law, climate litigation, and the general urgency to address climate change, do you think our legal educations need to be more environmentally conscious? Do you think uh, us law students or students in general, we should incorporate more uh, climate studies? Absolutely. I think the University of Amsterdam, for example, should make sure that the environmental studies element is incorporated in almost any discipline, whether it's politics, whether it's social science, anthropology, sociology, whatever, not just law. So I think that uh, this is really critical for every human being mm -hmm. because it's the way we live. What do you think? I, I have no idea how env environmentally conscious your legal studies are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. All right. Well, thank you very much. That is the end of our uh, interview. I think before we give our guests a warm round of applause, I'd just like to mention a few things, which is that tomorrow we have another interview with the chief economist of Google, Halvarian. And um, if you are interested in climate change and this issue, then do make sure to join us on the 27th of March. We have a cooperation with Spout25. And we have an interview with David Wallace Wells, also on climate, so please make sure to join that. But for now, please give our guests a warm round of applause.